Excellent. I'll split this um, talk in three parts. First, I'll explain a little bit about systematic reviews in general, then a bit about the background of this pre-registration form, and then I'll go through the pre-registration form itself with you. Um, so as you may know, or maybe not, um, the scientific literature has kind of exponentially increased in size over the past two decades. So already when I did my PhD, which was in the 1920s, no, it was like in the early 2000s, um, it was kind of common to start with a systematic review because that was a good way to get uh, an overview of the literature because the old days when professors were just sitting by the uh, fireplace uh, in their leather chair and they just read the journal that was sent that month and then they were up to date with the literature, that just doesn't exist anymore. Um, so nowadays, um, it's very hard to really get a grasp of what's being published. One of the solutions is to start PhD tracks with some kind of systematic review. And I see now more and more commonly, people don't even start with a systematic review, but with a scoping review. And I'll get to that momentarily. Um, so there are a number of different types of systematic of, of literature reviews. The first one, which is what people used to do, was called a narrative review. And basically it boils down to people reading a bunch of articles and then writing up what they think of it. And quite soon people started to realize that there was a large risk of bias and cherry picking here, because of course you could just omit whatever was inconvenient to how you thought things should be presented. So soon after that, people started thinking about more systematic ways to do this, which they appropriately called systematic reviews. Uh, and the goal was mostly to increase transparency, to provide a kind of systematic framework to do these and to make sure they're replicable. Meta-analyses are a specific subtype of systematic reviews where you do everything that you do in a systematic review, except that you are in the circumstance that your question can be answered by looking at effect sizes that you get from the articles. That's not always the case. You don't always have a question that boils down to a Cohen's D or a correlation, but sometimes you do. And in that case, you use a meta-analysis, which is a, a statistical analysis. And in that case, your type of systematic review is also often called a meta-analysis. So this is a little bit confusing. Then another type of systematic review is called a scoping review, sometimes called an evidence map. And there you don't actually look at the results of the studies. You really just look at the kind of research people did. And then after such a scoping review, you have a very good overview of what the literature looks like, how many people did experiments, how many people looked at mediators, how many people did qualitative studies. And that's a good starting point to then do systematic reviews where you actually do look at what they found. The reason why you often split this up nowadays is that looking at the results and looking at the quality of studies, which you also always do if you look at results, is a lot of work. If you only look at the method studies used and the kinds of definitions they used, for example, and which studies were done when, that's easier to do. So you have a complete overview and then you can do targeted systematic reviews only where you really know that it's worthwhile to go through the effort of extracting all the results. So these are common types of systematic reviews that you may encounter. And if you do a systematic review, it has four stages. You start with the search and then you input your query into a number of bibliographic databases. PsycInfo is a well-known one, PubMed. Then you usually get a lot of articles that you're actually not interested in. So false positives, so to speak. And then you do what we call screening. So you go through all these uh, hits, all these bibliographic records, and you look at the ones that you're actually interested in. And then from those, in the next step, you start extracting the information that you want to look at. And then for a small proportion of the articles that you found the first time, you have this uh, the data from the articles in a machine readable format. So for example, in a spreadsheet, in SPSS, in R, in a kind of table uh, shape. And then you do the synthesis. Synthesis is just, for some reason, <laughs> the name that's usually uh, used for analysis in a, a literature uh, review context. Literature reviews are also called evidence syntheses. So for some reason, they tend to call this a synthesis. So if you have a quantitative systematic review, often you will try to do a meta-analysis if you don't have too much heterogeneity in the effect sizes. In, in a meta-analysis context, heterogeneity in effect sizes doesn't mean necessarily that they're different because they will always be different. It means if you have a lot of heterogeneity, that it's unlikely that those effect sizes were drawn from the same sampling distribution. In other words, it's unlikely that there is one true effect size 
and the only differences in effect size that you found in the studies are just because of sampling variation or measurement error. It's because there are actually different effect size. If you have a lot of heterogeneity, you can't do a meta-analysis. Um, so <laughs> usually when you do, want to do a meta-analysis, you just do a systematic review. And then at the end, you conduct the, the meta-analysis. Then you find out your heterogeneity. And then if your heterogeneity is low enough, you can report the meta-analysis. And otherwise, you usually still report the meta-analysis, but then you tell people that they shouldn't look at it because you have too much heterogeneity. So these are the four stages that you use for a systematic review. Any systematic review. If it's qualitative systematic review, for example, of qualitative literature, you also still have synthesis. You also still have to um, synthesize all the results, aggregate everything, and make some statements about the whole of the literature. So these four stages are in every systematic review. And you always start with what you could call a fifth stage, which is planning. And the planning starts the other way around. You start with synthesis, thinking about which analysis you want to do. Then you think about what you need to extract in order to answer those questions. Then you think about what you need to exclude during screening. And then you think about how your search should look. So you answer usually answer these questions roughly in this order. And one of the most difficult things here is thinking about the extraction, what you actually want to take from the papers. That's actually easy for effect sizes. I mean, of course, once you start doing it, you'll, you'll find out that even though you are interested in, for example, Cohen's D, people do a structural equation model and they only report uh, regression coefficients. So then the question is, how the hell are you going to get from a regression coefficient from a structural equation model to the Cohen's D you need? Or they report uh, means and they don't report any effect sizes. But apart from that, which is in the end statistics, those are quite easy to extract. But other things can be a lot harder. For example, you can you want to look at uh, target population characteristics, maybe the study design, maybe the constructs that they study. But then what do you mean exactly with target population characteristics? Are you going to extract people's age? Are you going to extract sex? Or are you going to extract gender instead of sex, which is arguably psychologically more relevant? And if you look at study design, are you going to extract the time between the different measurements? Because of course, not every study only has one measurement moment. And then which unit are you going to use? And are you going to add covariates? And if you add covariates, and if you want to look at studied constructs, do you use, look at the author's own words? If they say that they measured knowledge, are you going to extract it as knowledge? Even if you look at the, uh, the measurement instrument, actually they measure something that's closer to risk perception or maybe attitude or self-efficacy. Or do you recode everything into your own definitions so that at least it's consistent over your systematic review? So you have a definition of when knowledge is measured and when attitude is measured, and then you just look at what they measure and you recode. And then which definitions are you used? Because often in the literature, these definitions aren't good enough to actually code measurement instruments. So do you then first develop a set of definitions or do you cave and do you just use author's own words again, accepting that actually then you will uh, end up clustering different constructs in the same cluster. But if you think about it, the same goes for gender. If you uh, want to extract gender, do you use author's own words or do you decide to code the kinds of genders they use or do you predefine some categories? So for all of these entities, everything basically you can get from studies, you have these questions. Do you want to extract in categories? Do you use their words or do you use your own categories? Or do you extract literally what they say as a kind of qualitative data? And do you code again? So that's one of the hardest questions you have to answer. And that's usually what you want to start with, because that's not something you only want to start thinking about once you have your articles because this generally has implications for how you screen and how you do the query. And trying to summarize these things, because I do quite a lot of systematic reviews in this online open access book, um, which is not done yet. I just add stuff to it when I have time, but there might be some uh, points there that could be useful to you if you want to do a systematic review. There are also a lot of R packages that can help. Metaphor is probably the most well-known one. It's made by Wolfgang Fichtbauer, also in the Netherlands, in Maastricht. Uh, and it's a very powerful package for analysis, uh, meta-analysis. That's why it's called Metaphor. Um, there's the Metaverse with a number of R packages that can help with searching literature, with uh, screening, with looking at the risk of bias. That's the ROP this one at the bottom right. 
And I have two R packages, one that is for pre-registrations in general, it's called Prereger, and it allows you to create your own pre-registration forms, which can be useful if you have a specific use case that's not covered well by existing pre-registration forms. And there's also a method before that's still in progress that's basically created to help you with systematic reviews. I'll tell a little bit about it. The idea is that you can uh, create your list of entities that you want to extract and the instructions for extraction and uh, validation of the extracted information in a spreadsheet. That's then imported and then it creates an extraction script, which is actually an R file where people extract. And that allows you to, when people did the extraction, immediately validate whether they extracted everything properly. It also allows you to import this set of extraction scripts, and every extraction script is basically a machine readable version of a PDF for your systematic review. Extract all those into R and then do your analysis. And it also allows you, if somebody else also has a bunch of these extraction scripts, to combine them because it uses unique article identifiers that allow you to combine information from multiple extraction scripts to create a larger systematic review. So as a research group, you can easily accumulate a larger and larger database of machine readable literature. But mostly here, we are here, we are here to talk about the pre-registration form. This is the, um, the preprint where we explain a little bit about the background. This actually started when I was supervising a, a master thesis student who wanted to do a systematic review about um, soccer, something with yellow cards, red cards, something. I don't, I'm not very much into sports, so I don't know anything about the substance, but he wants to do something with, with soccer. And of course, we wanted to pre-register it. But it turned out that no pre-registration forms existed for this. So I went to Twitter and I asked people I knew, like, isn't there something here? Prospero is a very well-known pre-registration um, provider for systematic reviews, but they only do health-related re systematic reviews. And then I don't have much reach on Twitter, but fortunately, um, somebody I knew does, so he retweeted it. And then we started to discussing this and um, thinking about whether we couldn't, it wouldn't be nice if we could add something to the open science framework so that you could pre-register any systematic review. And Nikki, uh, he's a veterinarian, but he also does a lot of qualitative research, which wouldn't be my first association with the veterinarian. But he also ran, ran into the same problem, that he couldn't pre-register his stuff anywhere. And then eventually uh, we got in touch with Brian Nosek, or actually he got in touch with us. Um, and he responded and he put us, us in touch with some people from the Open Science Framework to start working on this. So then slowly a larger and larger group of people snowballed together. It was really kind of like a serendipitous process. We didn't have a systematic way to get to this list of people. They were just people we knew who have a lot of experience with systematic reviews. And we started working on this. And in this process, especially Olmo uh, took a lead role. He's a, a PhD student from Tilburg University, almost done now. Or I think he is done, but he just still has to do his FIVA. Um, and he's also, um, yeah, he also collaborated on the Open Science Framework blog post when we launched the uh, the pre-registration form. So this QR code, which will also be in the slides that are at the URL I sent earlier, so I'll send them around, uh, links to this blog post where the Center for Open Science presents the, the form. So the idea of this systematic review form was to make it as inclusive as possible, because we kind of started out from frustration that you could only use it for health-related systematic reviews, the Prospero one. So we wanted to have one that was actually um, as widely applicable as possible, because basically, a systematic review boils down to getting some sources, written sources. You don't get your data from people, just from like written stuff. And then you integrate this in some way. So we wanted to make a form that works for all disciplines and all review types. And as a consequence, there are not really obligatory items. On the OSF, we made all the items obligatory. You can just say this doesn't apply and ideally explain why it doesn't apply. Um, because, of course, if you want to have something that applies to all disciplines and all review types, you're always going to ask some questions that don't always apply. So this is what, it, uh, what the preprint uh, looks like. So it's implemented on the Open Science Framework. I also implemented it in this pre-record package that you can use to specify your own pre-registration forms. But it also allows you to create a, an R Markdown pre-registration template that you can just fill out with your answers and that you can then render as a part of your R Markdown or Quarto file, if you are into uh, reproducible manuscripts. 
So to go by, go through the form, it starts with uh, basically the metadata. That's, I think, something that you won't have to think too much about. It's the title, the contributors, subjects, and then the fourth point is the tasks and roles. So basically, who does what? And there are some taxonomies for this. There are three. At least they're working on the second credit version, and there's an ontology of roles for research. Um, the advantage of this is that it allows you, with your research team, to discuss in advance who will do what and how this will be credited in the end. Uh, the disadvantage of credit is that it's also um, pen discipline. So because it covers all disciplines, it's super vague. So one of the terms is uh, conceptualization, and another is methodology, and another is visualization. So generally, for specific cases, you'll want to maybe make a more specific task list to organize who will do what, and then think about to which credit item it translates, so that you can think about how people will credit, be credited. So those are the first four points. Then we actually start thinking about the systematic review itself. So for type of review, this is just a text field. So you can just add what type of review you want to do. For example, a meta-analysis or a scoping review or just a systematic review, if you are not specifically planning to do a meta-analysis. There are also other terms uh, in different fields. They also, for example, evidence map is quite common in ecology, but I haven't used heard anybody use it in psychology so far. And this doesn't matter. There are no right or wrong answers. Just explain to people what kind of review you will be doing or name it. Then explain which stages you distinguish. I already mentioned earlier that typically there are four stages at least. You have search, screening, extraction, and synthesis. But you could distinguish preparation, for example. Or you might want to repeat your search um, later on. Or you might have one stage where you consult citizens if you combine this with citizen science to help them prioritize. So in the review stages, you just list all the stages that you go through. And then in the current review stage, you just list the one where you are. Then you name the start date and the end date. Um, that's well quite simple. People tend to be quite optimistic here. So this is quite a positive uh, point. Um, and then you explain the background. So this is kind of like a mini, mini, mini version of your introduction of an article. Basically, why do you even do this? <laughs> then you explain your primary research questions and your secondary research questions. The primary research questions are the research questions that mostly shape your design. So they informed how, how you will do your uh, review, just like for an empirical study. The primary questions shape your design and the secondary questions are things that you are also interested in and that you can kind of sneak in without having to uh, change your design. Then separately, we have expectations and hypotheses. These are separate because well, generally, hypotheses are basically just reformulated research questions in quantitative research. But in qualitative research, people sometimes have specific expectations without having any hypotheses. And in quantitative research, that's also possible. You might do a quantitative study where you don't formulate hypotheses, but you do have some expectations. So you don't intend to test any theory in the formal theory testing, for example, null hypothesis significance testing um, sense of the word but you might still have expectations about what you might find. So you can list those here because that will help future you and maybe others to see whether this in some way is associated to the kinds of decisions you take. Then you list your dependent variables or your outcomes, which are kind of the same, of course, or if you don't have a quantitative design and you don't look at associations, basically just the main variables you're interested in. And then secondarily, you list your independent variables or interventions, treatments, manipulations, whatever you want to call it. And then any additional variables that you have. Then you describe the software that you intend to use, including versions and stuff. And then you describe who paid you to do this. Then you list conflicts of interest. I mean, this is in principle simple, but it can take some reflection to think about what conflicts of interest might be. And to help a bit, there's item 20, overlapping authorships. Because if you do a systematic review, um, some of the papers that you include may be written by somebody in the research team. So for example, if you have a supervisor that did a lot of research in an area, and now you're all together going to do a systematic review about that area, maybe like a quarter of the papers, they are a co-author on. How are you going to deal with that? 
because they of course will have different ideas about the quality of those papers than about other papers. So it's useful to in advance think about how to deal with this and how to for example make sure they are not involved in that process if they are uh, an author of one of those papers. Then you go into uh, more detail and you start describing your search strategy. You start with listing the databases. Those are PsycInfo, um, yeah, Igris, PubMed, th stuff like that. And then after that, you describe the interfaces. Interfaces are the, the website you go to to search in a database. EBSCO is, a, is an example. Ovid is an example. PubMed is an exception because they are also an interface. But often you uh, consult databases through different interfaces. And the way that you can search a database often depends both on the database, on the kind of uh, fields they store, for example. Sometimes they have, well, they always have keywords, but sometimes they have uh, yeah, so-called uh, mesh keywords. Those are human designated keywords. So the organization that maintains the database actually has humans attaching keywords to papers, other humans than the authors. Um, and other databases don't have such a system. And of course, if they do have such a human curated uh, taxonomy of keywords, it's super useful to search because then you also know for a given term what the parent term is, like the higher level in the clustering. So these databases have different kinds of fields that you can search in. And those interfaces have different kinds of uh, ways you can combine the fields you search in. So those are both important to know if you do a systematic review and important to think about if you plan them. Not that you have much choice because the university you are at just has a given interface for a given database, but these are important for how you will do your search. Then, where do you look at gray literature? So gray literature is literature that isn't published in, uh, in a journal. So if you do a research that's a bit more applied, for example, my area is behavior change originally. So I used to do research, my PhD was about ecstasy use, like those pills, MDMA, why people start using it, why people stop using it, why they get it tested or not, why they drink enough water or not. Um, if you are in an applied field like that, then quite a lot of the research is done by uh, NGOs and NGOs write reports and they put them on their website, but they don't write papers and they don't send anything to a journal, but they will still have results that might be relevant to your literature review. So in the gray literature bit, you describe whether you will look at these uh, results and if so, how you're going to go about it and stuff. Then inclusion exclusion criteria. So when do you want papers to be part of your um, included list of uh, articles and when don't you want to, them to be included? And then the query strings. The query strings are the, well, the queries are basically the, the kind of sentence that you enter into the databases to search your articles. Then you usually have some articles that you know you need to find. Checking whether you actually do find those with your search is one way to validate your search. But there are also other ways. You could also take a sample of hits and present them to an expert, or there are different things you can think about. And you might have any other search strategies that weren't asked about in these preceding items, and then you can list them here. Then, whether you want to contact authors, because quite often uh, you need to get their papers, that's the easy part, but also quite often to, if you want to do a meta-analysis, for example, you often, to compute the effect sizes you need, you often need information that's not reported in their papers. And quite a lot of these things, of these articles, were written before open science became normal. And even now there's still some resistance to publishing data and publishing everything. So quite often you actually have to email people to get the stuff you need to do your systematic review. So here you can describe how your procedure will be and where you want to disclose the results. For example, how many people answered, which people answered or not. Then sometimes if you're moving in a far, fast moving topic, for example, something COVID related, like two years ago, three years ago, um, you know that your search expires quite quickly because research appears very, very quickly. Sometimes you know it lasts for a bit longer. And here you can describe how often you want to repeat your search. You can also justify um, why you think this search strategy will work and then include anything that you still missed um, about the search. Then we get to the second stage, the screening. For screening as well, you have stages normally. For example, you can use a AS review. That's, a, I think, a Python package, also developed in the Netherlands, coincidentally. Um, 
So either I have a very Dutch focused bubble or the Netherlands is doing quite a lot of systematic review stuff. Um, and it uses machine learning to help you with the screening. Because for the screening, typically, you have to go through thousands of hits only to include about a few dozen or a hundred articles. So you make the same kinds of decision. It's really just kind of like signal detection. You'd really just try to find the articles that uh, match your inclusion criteria. And machine learning can be quite useful for this. So if you use such a machine learning approach with AS review, for example, uh, then you might have a stage where you, as a human screen, a first set of articles, then this training data is presented to AS review, then AS review screens rest, then as a human, you verify what they did. But if you only, only use humans, you might just have stages where one human screens or maybe two humans screen independently. So you can describe that here. Then you describe whether you want to mask or blind um, screeners from information. You might want to blind them from the journal, for example, or from the date, because people might think that more recent articles are better and might be biased towards including those. Or they might think that certain journals are better and they might be biased towards including those. Then which ex exclusion criteria the screeners actually use? You never use inclusion criteria during screening. Because for example, if you're looking at uh, experiments and they have to be done with, uh, with children on, under the age of 12, for example, um, then both of those are exclusion criteria. You exclude everything that's with older participants than 12 and everything that's not an experiment. There's no way that one of those could actually veto the other exclusion criterion. It's not like the case that if you have an experiment, but they are with older participants, you would still include it. So during the screening, you only have exclusion criteria. And if you have inclusion criteria, you reformulate them into exclusion criteria. Then the literal instructions for the screening. Ideally, if you prepare a systematic review, you prepare this whole package and the instructions and stuff such that uh, a random bachelor or master thesis student could do it, could do the screening and could do the extraction. Because that's a way to make sure that you don't actually use any implicit understanding that you and your research team have. Because if you do base this on implicit understanding that you share with your research team members, that decreases the replicability and the transparency, of course. Then, how you're going to look at reliability. If you have two screeners, you could look at interrelated reliability, for example. And how you're going to reconciliate screeners who disagree, when one person thinks a paper should be included and the other thinks they should be excluded. Then, sometimes, I've never seen it, but my co-authors ensured me that this could happen. Sometimes you actually don't want to look at everything that you include. You want to sample a subset. If so, you can describe the procedure here. And then again, you justify everything. You explain how you're going to share your data and you can list any miscellaneous uh, details that you didn't list yet. Then we are already at the third stage, the extraction. There you list all the entities. That's quite, it uh, can be quite extensive, especially if you define them here. Then the stages for the extraction, that's similar to with the screening. The instructions for the extractors again, whether you want to blind to the extractors, again, for example, to the, uh, to the authors, or to the um, journal, whether you're going to look at reliability if you have multiple independent extractors, and if you have multiple independent extractors, how you're going to uh, reconcile disagreements. And again, why you think this extraction procedure is a good fit given your research goals. So this is a bit more about epistemology. Um, how you're going to share your data and anything that you couldn't fit in the other items. And then we get to the analysis or synthesis and quality assessment. Which data transformations you plan to do? For example, convert everything to a correlation or convert everything to Cohen's D or something like that. How you're going to deal with missing data? How you're going to validate your data? Make sure that the data actually are, well, correct, that they actually um, are valid and can be useful. How you look at the quality of the studies? For example, if there are more um, participants then the estimates will be more accurate than if there are only a few participants. But there might also be bias, for example, if the samples are not random. Your synthesis plan is basically just the analysis plan you would have for another study. So how are you going to answer your research questions? And if you do more formal testing, what are your uh, inference criteria? So when will you draw which conclusion? And again, if it's a really high stake systematic review, you might want to blind the synthesists or you might want to blind one synthesis, or you might want to have multiple synthesis. Because as we know now, if more, multiple people analyze the same data set, they tend to come to different results. So you might want to use different analysis here. 
Then again, if you use multiple uh, synthesis or analysis, you need some way to reconcile disagreements. Then you might want to look at publication bias. That's the uh, phenomenon that journals tend to want to publish more exciting, significant results. And if that happens a lot, of course, whatever you conclude based on the literature will, be, uh, will give a distorted view of what happened. Whether you want to do any sensitivity analysis, and then again, the justification, your data management, and then any miscellaneous details. And that's actually it for, uh, for the form. I'll stop the recording now, and then if there are any questions, um, you can ask them. But you'll have to come close to the laptop.